So I am here with Will Markow, the Vice President of Applied Research at Lightcast. Let's start with the high level stuff, Will. If you could tell me a little bit about the lay of the land and what Lightcast and your team does. Absolutely. And thank you again, Simone, so much for having me. Really excited for this conversation today. Just to give you a little bit of background about Lightcast and, and the work that we do and how it intersects with the cybersecurity world, uh, Lightcast really strives to be the global authority when it comes to information about the job market. We provide data and consulting services through a mix of advisory work, software tools, and APIs that really help companies, educators, government officials, workforce development officials, and others better understand what's happening in the job market and in their workforce at any given point in time. And they can use that information to really make better decisions about the workforce. And the logical question is, okay, so why are we uh, involved in the cybersecurity space? And that's because the cybersecurity workforce really faces some of the most intractable issues that we see across the entire economy. And so there's really been a deficit of good information and good data about the cybersecurity workforce historically that we've really tried to come in and, and fill that gap with more up-to-date and more granular and actionable data. So uh, really excited to get into the discussion about some of the data and some of the things we're seeing in the, the workforce. But um, I think that will uh, probably come later in the conversation. Yeah, great. Um, so, you know, we've talked about this in the past and certainly have very similar viewpoints on how organizations and companies can take a more strategic perspective on how to think about the cybersecurity workforce shortage, how to actually identify and make good decisions based on what they need to do. What are some of the common misperceptions that you view your clients, people that you work with having about this particular topic? It's a great question. And I think there are a few misperceptions that are pretty common in the market. I think the first misperception is that it is just a skills gap. And I think there definitely is a skills gap in cybersecurity. And we, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But I, I think that there's also an expectations gap that a lot of employers don't realize that they are contributing to some of the hiring challenges that they have by asking for certain credentials or certifications or skill sets that may or may not be important in the roles that they're asking them for. So give you a concrete example, which we, we see more often than you would think, is that uh, take a CISSP. This is a certification, which is a great certification, and it has its place, and it's important for people who are more advanced in their careers to consider getting a CISSP. But we see a lot of employers asking for a CISSP, which requires minimum of five years of prior work experience to qualify for a full CISSP, asking for this credential along with no more than two years of prior work experience, which it's impossible to have the two. And the, the hiring managers, it's not their fault. They know what a CISSP is. They know you have to have five years of work experience, but there's something in the internal process between and the communication between the hiring manager and the HR team building that job requisition that results in a disconnect. And so I think that one big misperception is that either uh, it's just a skills gap or it's just an expectations gap or hiring managers don't know what they're asking for. The reality is hiring managers know what they're asking for. The reality is um, there are people out there who could fill some of these jobs, but the uh, is, there is a breakdown in communication in that process of building those job requisitions. So that creates that expectations gap. That said, <laughs> I also hear a lot of people saying, oh, wait, there is no skills gap. What are we talking about? Um, that's also not true. There also is a deficit of workers. When we look across the cybersecurity workforce, we see that we only have about two-thirds of the workers we need to fill all of the jobs that employers are demanding. So that effectively means we're stepping onto the cyber battlefield, missing a third of our army. So there's also a talent shortage. There's also a skills gap. Uh, and I think anybody who says it's just one or the other is contributing to some of the misperceptions in the market and is contributing to some of the uh, information gaps that are exacerbating some of the talent gaps and the expectation gaps in the field. Yeah, I, I, th I can totally see where that comes into play. I know we've seen that ourselves in the expectation gap. What is your recommendation? How do you propose that we kind of solve that expectation gap since 
job recs are one of those interesting areas where it's in the domain of HR, but the hiring managers do it. How do you, how do we improve that process? So the first thing that you need to do, which I think you started to touch upon, is you need to break down silos. If you're in the cybersecurity world, if you're a CISO or a cybersecurity manager, you need to view HR as your friend and partner, not your rival, which I think is the culture in a lot of organizations. Um, <clears throat> HR is also trying to work with cybersecurity managers to get the best job requisitions out there. And you need to figure out how can you work together in a more collaborative fashion. And I tell this to HR <laughs> folks all the time as well, is that uh, one of the first things you need to think about when building a job requisition is how is this supporting the stakeholders that it most needs to support? And how is it driving business value within your company? So the first thing you need to do, <laughs> be collaborative. Second thing you need to do is you really need to define what is it that this person in this role needs to do? Not just at a job title level, but at the underlying skill level. A lot of people call this skills-based hiring, which is a very amorphous term. <laughs> and it means a little bit of uh, one thing to one person, something different to someone else. So sometimes I, I stay away from that nomenclature, but it, it really is a manifestation of skills-based hiring, is understanding and inventorying what are the skills associated with each role within your team so that you can build your job requisition around those skills that people need, not just the credentials or degree requirements that people have used as imperfect proxies for those skills. And once you do that, you can then start to figure out, okay, which skills are going to be most critical to include in the job requisition when we're going out and hiring for people versus when we're training those people internally? And which of those skills are need-to-haves versus nice-to-haves when somebody's walking through the door? give you a concrete example of this in practice. There's a financial services company we worked with that was trying to right-size some of its job descriptions around the skills, not the credentials, not the certifications that were most important for proficiency in that role. And they were able to identify a few things that they could just take out, like a, uh, a bachelor's degree requirement or a certification requirement or some uh, emerging skills that were really nice-to-haves and not need-to-haves and by just making a few simple tweaks to their job descriptions, they were able to reduce the average hiring cost by over $10,000 per hire, and they were able to expand their candidate pool by over 60%. So sometimes just making those slight tweaks to the skills you're asking for and the credentials you're asking for can have huge benefits to companies when they go out and hire for cybersecurity workers. Yeah, we see that a lot too. Um, one of the, I think, natural follow-up questions, especially for organizations who have a desire, you know, as leaders to have a more skills-based approach, they want to understand what they're actually looking for in the roles. What are some of the things that you often work with or recommend to clients to do if they're starting this process on their own? We find that most folks do not know where to start. They hear the term skills-based and they have no idea what that actually means in practice, where to start, et cetera. So we generally find that there are four pillars to becoming skills-based in your hiring and talent management practices. And the first, which we always emphasize should be the first, is business value. How are you driving value to your business by taking a skills-based approach? And there are different ways you can implement that. But the simplest is just figuring out what are my strategic priorities for the next six to 12 months or beyond, and what skills will my team need in order to execute those strategic priorities? So we always say that's the first pillar. <laughs> if you don't have any idea how you're driving business value, don't do something. Right. <laughs> uh, beyond that, though, we also recommend that you have a pillar around skills-related strategy and governance. So this is really how are you thinking about implementing skills within your team? Is it that you want to have a common understanding of who has what skills? You need to take a baseline. Is it that you need to understand what are the future-ready skills you're going to need to train your existing people in? And really, what is your skills philosophy? Um, and how are you going to make sure that you're consistent in how you're rolling out that skills-based approach? Um, beyond that, we also recommend that you think about the data side. How are you capturing that information? If you uh, can't measure something, you can't manage it. And so you need to have a good idea for what types of 
data can you use to baseline your existing team skills, but also to track how skill requirements are evolving in the future so that you can upskill your team and build those capabilities as they change in the market. Um, and then the last thing we say is think about which stakeholders you're going to need to engage with internally. It's not just an exercise to be isolated to the cybersecurity team. It's not just an exercise to be isolated to the HR team. It's something that requires your entire organization to work together, especially in a field like cybersecurity that impacts the entire organization. And that has to have line of sight into what the rest of the organization is doing. And so we always say, don't neglect that stakeholder com management component. Make sure that you are reaching out proactively to the other business heads, to the folks in HR, the business partners, et cetera, who you need to work with in order to implement this uh, more of a skills-based approach across your team. And uh, because you also need to know what skills as does your cyber team need to have, but also what skills does the rest of the organization need to have when it relates to cyber, because you're probably going to be the ones who have to help. That's a really great point, because what you are in essence saying is when it comes to a people strategy and understanding building a cybersecurity program, you need to be effective at building a business case to justify what that strategy is going to look like as much as you build a business case to implement tools or technology improvements or process changes um, as you implement controls on the entirety of the cybersecurity program. So that really resonates. Um, Going back, though, when you think about the data, um, and obviously Lightcast is a, or, you know, you guys actually are a repository and capture a lot of the data on skills, job requisitions for cybersecurity in particular, but across the entire job market, really. Um, and, you know, in full disclosure, um, we are a consumer of Lightcast data, so a plug to Lightcast there. But I think it would be really helpful to understand what exactly type of information are you capturing about skills? How do you do it? And I think to your point about emerging skills, what are some of the emerging skills that you all are seeing and how are you capturing those? It's a great question. And I'll take a step back just to give you some idea of how Lightcast is capturing data on skills in the market. And we found that historically, the data on skills when in cybersecurity or the rest of the job market for that matter, was very limited. Government data only gave an incomplete picture of the skills and the capabilities that were needed across different roles. And so when we started to try to capture skills across the market, we turned to two different data sources beyond just government data. The first is online job postings. We're going to tens of thousands of different job boards every day. We're capturing job postings pulling them down, running them through an artificial intelligence engine that extracts information about what skills are being demanded by employers in different roles, different industries, different locations across the entire economy, across the globe. The second place we look are worker histories, such as professional social profiles, resumes, which give us line of sight into what somebody has done in their career up to this point, what the career trajectory looked like, and what skills they've picked up along the way. So using these two sources of information, one on the demand side for skills, one on the supply side for skills, we can build a very detailed portrait of the labor market in terms of the underlying skill sets that employers demand and that people have. And we can use this to track things over time. We can track skills in more real time to see what emerging trends are occurring. And we can also use it to start to project out what are some of the skills that are going to be increasingly important in the future. And that leads us to second part of your question of, okay, what are some of the skills that we're seeing that are emerging in cybersecurity especially? And I'll say cybersecurity is one of the fields that has the most skill evolution at the most rapid pace anywhere in the market. In just the past two years, we've seen that about 24%, so around a quarter of all skills required by cybersecurity professionals have shifted. So that means every two years, you're having to re-up a quarter of the skills that you have just to continue to do the job you're already in. And that skill evolution is primarily being driven by three different types of skill change. Um, one is just different types of cybersecurity frameworks and processes that people are increasingly using. So we're seeing rapid growth in things like threat hunting. We're seeing rapid growth in things like uh, different risk management frameworks and tools. And 
that's one of the uh, places where we're seeing some of the most rapid skill evolution. We're also seeing very rapid evolution when it comes to regulatory frameworks, though, and standards such as those coming out of NIST. Every time there's a new NIST framework or an update to an existing framework, that changes the skill sets that your people need to know. There are changes to privacy frameworks, et cetera. Um, But then the last and the one that most people talk about is technological change. And for cybersecurity, this is especially important because virtually every new technology has a digital component and every technology with a digital component must have a security component baked into it. And that means that there's a constant flood of new technologies that cybersecurity professionals have to engage with, have to interact with, and have to learn how to keep secure. Um, And this has certainly been exacerbated recently with all of the talk around ChatGPT and generative AI and how that's going to lower the barrier to entry for the bad actors as well as the good actors who are trying to combat them. Um, And so we see that this type of technological uh, innovation is definitely driving much skill change um, uh, for cybersecurity workers. And beyond just AI, which everybody knows is disrupting things, I'll also call out that one perennial technological uh, uh, shift that is constantly, constantly changing skills that need, are needed for cybersecurity pr- uh, professionals is cloud. <laughs> and it's every year we think, okay, maybe this will be the year that finally cloud isn't as big a deal. It isn't as growing as fast. It isn't as hard to, or expensive to fill for cybersecurity f- professionals. That still hasn't come. Maybe one day it will, but the cloud is just evolving so fast. Every new technology also has some interaction with the cloud now. And uh, we also see that cybersecurity professionals who have cloud security skills, they are harder to find. They command higher salaries, so they're more expensive for employers. That's great news for the people who have those skills. And uh, we definitely recommend that companies be very thoughtful about how you build those cloud skills in your teams because uh, uh, almost certainly it's going to be cheaper for you to think about training existing workers in those new technologies as opposed to going out and hiring someone on the spot market for talent with those skills. Yeah. It's interesting though, because when you think about the evolution and I, that statistic around the, the sort of two year mark and how that actually is what's constantly shifting, it, it seems to indicate that this is not a one-time inventory that needs to take place. It's a continuous requirement to stay on top of the, the skill requirements. Um, but to your point on even only two thirds of the positions are full and we still do have an actual talent shortage, you have to compensate with that by saying it's a continuous evolution because no one has a 100% retention rate. So you're going to be offboarding employees, onboarding new employees, having to upskill, having to identify where you're going to find those pools of talent. So looking at both sides of the equation is a, it's a never ending process. It's so true. And and just to, just to make the situation sound even more dire, the uh, macroeconomic backdrop of all this is that we have declining birth rates, we have declining immigration rates, we have declining labor force participation rates, all of which are going to lead to long-term talent shortages across the entire workforce, not just cybersecurity. And that means that these talent shortages are probably going to be persistent for a long time to come. And that means that we're going to have to figure out how do we wring as much value out of the people we've got for as long as we possibly can. And that requires that companies do exactly what you just described. You have to take a continuous process to understanding how is the market evolving? How are the skill needs of my team evolving? And how can I make sure that I'm continuously investing in my people and the skills that they have so that they don't become stale? And that actually has benefits, though, to retention as well. Because when you invest in your people, your people are going to be more invested in you and your company. And they're not going to say, well, if I want to advance my career, I have to look elsewhere. Uh, And so taking that continuous view of externally what's happening in the market and then translating that internally to how do I reinvest in my people doesn't just have benefits in terms of keeping your skill sets up to date, but it also can have benefits in terms of uh, team morale, retention rates, and other follow-on benefits. Well, given the state of the direness that you described, let's shift to maybe some some good news. Do you have any examples, and you don't need to name names, of any companies or organizations that at least are on the path to getting this right? And what does that look like? Yeah, great question. So the the good news is there are some bright spots. Uh, Some companies have been proactively trying to address some of these challenges. And I'll give you a couple of concrete examples. Um, There was a 
large manufacturing firm whose CIO was working closely with their security team and other technical teams and said, you know what, we, we know that we're going to have to constantly reinvent ourselves. We're going to have to constantly figure out what skills do we need to drive business value and to keep pace with technological change. And they first said, let's take an inventory of what do we have. So they figured out what were the skill sets that they currently had across their security teams and other technical teams. And then they said, let's compare that to what we're seeing in the market. Let's look externally to see what do our competitors have in terms of skill sets on the security teams. They said, let's look at what other companies and other industries have on their, in terms of skills on their security teams. And let's look to see what are the trends, which of these skills are growing the fastest and are costing the most for employers to hire in the market so that we can use that information to prioritize which skills we train for internally versus which skills we try to hire for externally. And they essentially built these skill profiles for every role within their teams that said, what are the skills you need to have today? But then what are the skills that are more future looking? These future ready skills that you can build with internal training that we'll provide for you um, that are really going to help us remain future ready, but also going to help you as an individual remain future ready. And this uh, CIO uh, was, I think, very good at engaging the team and talking to the team and explaining to them, this is why it's important for you. This is why we are investing in you as individuals to grow your career in a direction that helps both you and the company. Um, and they were able to build reskilling plans for every individual across the technical team. Um, and they had much higher engagement rates than you typically get with assessments uh, because the head of the department, the CIO, actually went out and said, this is important. It's a strategic priority. And we are doing it to invest in you because that helps our company as well. And it was, I think, a great example of how a business leader was able to align this skills-based hiring and reskilling strategy with all of the things we talked about earlier. There was stakeholder engagement. They were aligning it to business value and giving transparency to their team of how it aligned with business value. They had a data plan in place, and they just had a broader philosophy of how they wanted to roll this out that really resonated with the team. And so I thought that was a great example of how to do it. And the outcomes were great too. They were able to identify millions of dollars in talent acquisition savings. They were able to increase retention rates. And again, they were able to reap many of these follow-on benefits that, that we've been talking about. That's fantastic. Um, so maybe we'll conclude with this. If, you know, this sounds a little daunting to those that are listening and saying, how do I even get started on this? And I just want to see what's available out there in the public domain to at least get my feet wet. Um, what are some places that people can start? I know that Lightcast and your team in particular have done a lot in providing some of this information out in the public domain. Absolutely. So I, I would say the first place that you can look for this type of information is a website called cyberseek.org. Um, if you're unfamiliar with cyberseek.org, it's an interactive portal that provides data on supply and demand for cybersecurity jobs in states and metro areas across the United States. It also provides a career pathway that allows you to see what the opportunities are for individuals to enter into and advance within the cybersecurity field. And it also provides information about where there are training providers across the United States that you can go to in order to build the skills that you need to enter into the field. Uh, CyberSeq leverages Lightcast data. Uh, it's actually something that was built in partnership between Lightcast, CompTIA, as well as NICE, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. And it's a completely free uh, tool open to the public, and it can give you up-to-date, actionable information about the cybersecurity workforce. I'm also very excited to say that we'll be uh, putting in some new data to CyberSeq in early June. We're also going to be adding some features to CyberSeq that will provide more historical data so you can see how trends are shifting across the cybersecurity workforce and anticipate what will be happening in the future. You can also uh, use some of the new features as an employer to improve your job descriptions and to take more of a skills-based approach to writing job descriptions that align with the realities of the market. So that's that's a great place. There are also many other resources out there. Um, Lightcast has released some reports in the past about cybersecurity workforce, um, even just going to uh, NICE and their website. They have fantastic resources. 
Um, and there are many others out there. There's, there's no shortage of uh, free information about the cybersecurity workforce. So I, I would definitely encourage folks to go to CyberSea, go to NICE and, and other websites with, with great information on the, on the field.